Hi class. Hope your July 4th holiday was a really nice one. It's kind of a bad way to spoil it, huh, coming back to class on July 5th. Anyway, um, uh, you will recall that in your last lecture on July 3rd, you all talked about membrane sensing and where sensory stimuli begin. You talked a lot about membranes and one of the um, slides that you had on that lecture was this one and you talked about receptors and you talked about ion channel linked receptor. This is a receptor that you know when the receptor is activated the channel opens and ions go through. You talked about a G protein linked receptor and we're going to talk about that today. And then uh, you talked a little bit about the enzyme linked receptor. One of those kind of receptors would be like phototropin that we talked about earlier in class where you don't have a ligand but you have light activates that receptor and that activates a, an enzyme called a kinase which then continues the signal transduction chain. So what we want to do today is talk more about how do you amplify signals. So this is an important topic because you have to wonder about how is it that a single photon of light or the light of a firefly, one flash, can turn on 2,000 different genes or how your bodies as humans can sense the lack of gravity when you go into microgravity so that your body stops making bone and stops making muscle. How does that happen? How do you take these very low energy stimulations and amplify them into major physiological responses. We even talked about the touch stimulus. Remember back when we were talking about the Venus flytrap? Wow, just a little bitty touch on those hairs and that trap snaps shut and catches a fly. Or even the bladder wart where it can snap shut in less than a tenth of a second when it's touched by a water flea. Not much input stimulus, but a major response. How is it that you can take these sensory inputs and amplify them into major responses? So uh, as you learned in your lecture on uh, July 3rd, these amplification processes begin with the activation of a receptor. And there are many different kinds of receptors. Today, we're going to talk about G protein linked receptors uh, and use this as an example of a signal transduction chain in which there are multiple steps and each step in the chain creates what we call amplifiers, which then themselves create the next step, which creates more amplifiers. And so as you go from one step to the next step to the next step, you are increasing the number of amplifiers by a factor of five or 10 or even more. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, within a few seconds, you have when you start it with a single hormone binding to a receptor, you may have ended up in a minute with thousands of amplifiers in the cell. And, and that's how you amplify low energy input signals into major responses. And a good example of a multi-step signal transduction chain is one in which the receptor is a G protein linked receptor. Uh, and it's called a G protein linked receptor because the receptor here is linked to a special kind of protein called a G protein, which only binds to the receptor after the receptor is activated by, let's say, a hormone like a ligand. Once the ligand binds to the receptor, the G protein then binds to the receptor and it becomes activated. And when it's activated, then it actually undergoes some changes and part of the G protein then goes over and activates an enzyme and then that continues the signal transduction chain. So this kind of um, signal transduction chain exemplifies very well the process of going step by step and creating more amplifiers at each step. Uh, and so it's a very good example. It's also an example that won the Nobel Prize for uh, a couple of our colleagues at, at uh, Southwest Medical School in Dallas. They, they did a lot of the early studies on this and they actually got the Nobel Prize for this. So uh, it, it's been um, used in textbooks as a very good example of how do you amplify an input signal. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about G-protein linked signal transduction. 
Uh, the first thing we want to say is that the G protein, which binds to the G protein linked receptor, is heterotrimeric. That is, it has three parts and they're different from each other. They're called alpha, beta, and gamma. And we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about what activates G alpha and what does G alpha do when it's activated. And then we'll find out what happens, how do you turn it off? Because, you know, in signal transduction, whatever you turn on, you got to turn off. Because if you don't turn it off, you have chaos. All right, so let's um, go ahead and take a look at that signal transduction pathway. So this slide here shows the receptor, which is a G protein linked receptor. There's the activator of the receptor called a hormone. It doesn't have to be a hormone. It can be uh, like, for example, it could be in light or some physical stimulus, but in many cases it's a hormone. Like, for example, insulin has a G protein linked receptor. And um, all right, so you have a receptor. If the hormone binds to the receptor, that receptor then changes its shape, and that shape changes allows the G protein to bind to it and become activated. After it's activated, the G protein actually splits up into two parts. The G alpha and the beta and the gamma go do their thing and alpha does its thing. And G alpha acts as a kind of a relay molecule. It goes from the receptor where it was activated and it floats in the membrane to a target. It can be any one of a number of different enzymes. And that target is called an effector. It's something that does something. It affects something. And in, in our uh, talk today, we'll, we'll give as an example phospholipase C as the effector. And some we'll call this PLC, phospholipase C, when we refer to it. Phospholipase C further amplifies a signal by creating out of one of these lipids in here, it splits up a lipid and breaks it up into two parts, one part of which is IP3. So you're generating a number of these every second. And then this, to further amplify the signal, binds to a receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, which is filled with calcium. That opens a channel and calcium comes out. There's calcium. And then it activates a calcium binding protein, the most famous of which is called calmodulin. And then calmodulin can activate any one of like 20 different enzymes in the cell. So this pathway is very highly conserved both in plants and animals. It's virtually identical. So whatever we tell you about this pathway in plants, it'll be the same story in animals. In fact, calmodulin in plants is so close to human calmodulin that you could, if you knocked out the human gene, you could put in a plant gene and it would work perfectly well because it's virtually identical. Uh, and then this is an amplifier and it further amplifies typically by activating other things and then they amplify other things and so you get at every step you get further amplification. So you can imagine if you wanted to go from a stimulus to a response you could do it in one step but then you would only have one amplification step. The advantage of linking many steps together is that you create more and more amplifiers every time you go to another step. And, and thereby, you can go from a very low energy input stimulus, like the binding of a hormone to a receptor, and out of that, you can generate literally thousands of amplifiers in the cell that can then go do things and make the cell really change what it's doing. Okay, so let's take a closer look at G proteins and how they are activated and how they are turned off. And to do this, we go to this slide, which you have. So now here we're picturing the receptor and we're picturing the heterotrimeric G protein. It has alpha, beta, and gamma all stuck together. They're all one unit called a heterotrimeric G protein. In the inactive state, that is before it is activated, the G alpha is bound to GDP. That D stands for dye. This has two phosphates on it, GDP. As long as GDP is bound to G alpha, then this complex is inactive and it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there in the membrane. Now, if you activate the receptor and, uh, by a hormone binding to it, the receptor will change shape. So you see this shape here, 
and now you see this shape here is like a square or like a corner there. When it changes shape, the heterotrimeric G protein binds to it, and this activates the heterotrimeric G protein. And when it's activated, it kicks out GDP and replaces it with GTP. And GTP bound to G-alpha triggers a response in which G-alpha separates from beta and gamma. So here you have a separation. GTP bound G-alpha, beta and gamma, they go do their thing. Now if I was teaching a full course on this, I would tell you all the different things that beta and gamma go do in the cell. And they are signal amplifiers too, but we're not going to talk about what they do. We're only going to talk about what G-alpha does. And G-alpha is only active after the heterotrimeric G protein binds to the receptor that activates the heterotrimeric G protein, makes GTP bind to G-alpha, separates out beta and gamma from G-alpha, and now G-alpha is one of the amplifiers, okay? And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the rate at which G-alpha separates from beta-gamma has been measured, and it was only measured a couple years ago. It was a really elegant experiment. If you guys want to know more about it, I can talk about it sometime. It's really a neat experiment. Very difficult to figure it out, but these guys figured it out, and they calculated that the rate at which G-alpha and beta-gamma separate is 10 per second. So every second you have, G, after it's activated, G-alpha, 10 of these heterotrimeric G proteins separate and you create 10 G-alphas every second after it's activated. Okay, so now you have activated G-alpha. It then floats in the plane of the membrane and goes over to find something to activate. And in this case, we're going to call that an effector, E1, and, and the actual enzyme that we're going to be talking about is phospholipase C. That is an enzyme that when it's active, it hydrolyzes a lipid called PIP2 and creates another amplifier called IP3. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in any event, the main point I want to make here is that once G-alpha is activated, it goes and it activates some enzyme. And they've calculated how fast this enzyme works. In other words, how many amplifiers does it create every second? And it creates five every second. So in one second, you've created 10 G-alphas and then the next second you've created out of each one of those 10 is activating five, is, is activating E1, and then each one of these guys is, is creating five more amplifiers. So in a couple of seconds you have 50 amplifiers in the cell. Uh, and that's just a start because that's talking about one hormone binding to one receptor. Now typically you have mm, in a neighborhood of uh, about a million hormones. Uh, and by the way, that would be on a molar scale would be very low. It'd be like femtomolar. You would have about a million of these or more hormones binding to a receptor at one time. So think about this. A million of these guys happening at one time instead of one. Each one of the million generating 10 uh, G-alphas. And then each one of the G-alphas activating PLC that creates five more amplifiers. You're talking about a few billion amplifiers in a few seconds, which, and that's all starting with just a few little guys binding to a receptor. In any event, you've turned on this system, and now the challenge is how do you turn it off, right? Because if, if you don't turn it off, you have a bad situation. And in fact, there's an example of a bad situation that is very deadly in the world, and that's called cholera. You may have heard of the, the disease. The disease is a disease where um, people um, are continually flushing their intestines and their uh, digestive tract, and, and so they end up dying because of lack of water. They can't control the uh, elimination of water from their bodies. And the reason for this is because they are infected by a cholera bacterium which creates a toxin called cholera toxin, and what cholera toxin does is it freezes G-alpha in the active state, so it can't be turned off. And so you have this system permanently on. And what G-alpha is doing in your body, or in the body of a person infected with cholera, is it's activating a pump 
which is pumping salt into the intestine all the time. And where, as you know, in this class, wherever salt goes, water follows. So water is continuously moving into your digestive system and flushing it out, just continuously. Where's that water coming from? It's coming from your body. So guess what? Your body gets dehydrated, and typically people die of that in cholera, and, 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 the, and the disease of cholera. But I'm just using that as an example of whatever you turn on, you got to turn off, because if you don't, bad things happen. All right, so now, how do you turn off this uh, activated GTP bound G alpha. You do that because it turns out that G alpha is itself an enzyme and its enzyme activity is GTP ACE. Now you guys know what an ACE is, ASE, because we talked about it a thousand times. Proteases, RNases, lipases, we talked about it a lot in class. This is a GTP ACE, which guess what? It hydrolyzes GTP. And when it does, it converts GTP back to GDP, and then that inactivates G alpha, and it goes back to this state, heterotrimeric bound. So let's review. How do you turn it on? You turn it on. It starts off inactive with GDP bound. How do you turn it on? You turn it on by activating the receptor. When the receptor is activated, this allows the heterotrimeric G protein to bind to it. That binding activates G alpha. G alpha then separates from beta and gamma, and it becomes an amplifier. It, its next step in the amplification is it binds to an effector, in this case phospholipase C, and this creates another amplifier called IP3, which we'll talk about in a minute. And now the only problem is how do you turn it off? And you turn it off basically by itself. It is a GTPase, and it can turn itself off by uh, converting GTP to GDP, and that turns it off. So what cholera toxin is doing is it's binding to G alpha in such a way that G alpha's activity, its GTPase activity, is killed. So it can't turn itself off. It's stuck in the on configuration and it just keeps doing what it's doing. And in cholera, that's really bad because it just continually flushes your, your body of, of, um, with water coming into your intestines. And, and that's, so that's an example of what would be bad about it. Okay, so we've gone through this cycle. What I want to do now is go back to this and fill this in a little bit better because remember what we said, you activate the receptor, this activates the heterotrimeric G protein and separates G alpha from beta and gamma. And in this image here, you don't see beta and gamma. You only see the G protein alpha, which has been separated from beta and gamma and is acting as a relay molecule. We call it a relay molecule because it relays between the receptor and the effector. It just shuttles between these two. So after it's activated, as you know, the membrane is fluid. You learned that in the last class. And so this guy can float in the membrane until it bumps into its effector. And the example we're giving of an effector molecule this time is phospholipase C, PLC. Its activity is to create, uh, to hydrolyze or to break up one of these lipids and generate uh, IP3, which is an amplifier. And then this amplifier, which is generated at the rate of five per second, Alpha is generated at the rate of 10 per second. Anyway, IP3 then goes to one of the internal membranes like endoplasmic reticulum or in plants, it can go to the vacuole and it binds to a receptor which opens a channel and allows calcium to come out, which increases the calcium. That activates a calmodulin, then act calmodulin then activates any one of maybe 20 different enzymes, each of which produces an amplifier. So, you know, I mean, you're talking about huge amplification and all of this is happening at blazing speed. Now, I call it blazing speed, but actually, believe it or not, uh, the rate of 10 per second in, in the enzyme world is really slow. The fastest enzymes get this. They generate from their product, from their uh, substrate, they can generate 400,000 products per second. So 400,000 products per second versus, let's say, 10 per second or 5 per second. So you know these guys are pretty slow. But still, 
even with just that slow five or 10 per second, you're generating hundreds or thousands of amplifiers in the cell within the space of a few seconds. Uh, and, and so um, to back up then, let's review. We are using this as an example of a typical signal transduction chain in which multiple steps are linked to one another and each step creates more amplifiers. And by linking multiple steps together, you have the ability to create literally thousands or millions or billions of amplifiers within a few seconds. And so most sensory responses in your body and in a plant body happen very, very quickly because these processes are happening very, very quickly. Okay, so um, that's kind of a quick overview and you have a text that goes with some of this so you can read that. Uh, this is not meant to be a full lecture. Um, now what we want to do, we, we've, we've already talked about the three parts, alpha, beta, and gamma. What activates G-alpha is binding to the receptor. What does G-alpha do? It floats in the membrane until it bumps into an effector and then it turns it on. What turns off G-alpha? It turns itself off because it is, in fact, a G-TPase. And the only question is how fast does that happen? And there are proteins in the cell that regulate the speed at which G-alpha turns itself off. Some of the proteins that associate with G-alpha speed it up and some slow it down. So for each signal transduction chain, the rate at which G-alpha turns itself off would be different. And you would have to look at every individual case to figure out how fast that happens. But of course, as I indicated, if G-alpha binds to cholera toxin, it can't turn itself off. It's stuck in the on configuration and the person that has cholera is in really deep trouble. Okay, so what are some tools for studying G-protein signaling? And that would be shown on this slide. We already talked about, whoop, talked about cholera toxin, and it blocks the GTPase activity of G-alpha and thus prevents it from inactivating itself. After cholera toxin treatment of cells, G-protein is stuck in the on mode because it cannot convert its bound GTP to GDP. So we've already talked about this. Pertussis toxin is another toxin. You've heard of uh, whooping cough. Well, that, that bacteria that causes that has a toxin called pertussis toxin. And what it does is it prevents G-alpha from interacting with the receptor. So if G-alpha can't bind to the receptor, it can never be activated. So in the presence of pertussis toxin, G-alpha cannot be stimulated to release GTP in favor of GTP. So after pertussis toxin, the G protein is stuck in the off mode because it cannot interact with the activated receptor. So this is another toxin. Scientists actually use these to figure out whether the signal transduction pathway is using a G protein pathway. They can use these toxins. Lithium is an interesting um, actually psychotropic drug. Uh, it blocks the enzyme that recycles IP3 back to its basic building block, which is called an acetal, and thus it prevents the resynthesis of PIP2, which is a lipid that PLC breaks down to generate IP3. So what does lithium do? It prevents uh, the pathway by preventing the cell from making more of the PIP2, which phospholipase C needs to create IP3. So in the presence of lithium, you are lowering the stimulatory ability of a body to respond because its G protein pathway is really suppressed because it's lacking the IP3 amplifier, okay? And then another one down here, uh, this is, uh, there's a version of GTP that cannot be hydrolyzed because it's got that gamma group on it. And if this sticks to G-alpha, then, then G-alpha can't hydrolyze it, so it's stuck in the on mode. So this would be like uh, cholera toxin. It would stick the G-protein in, in the active uh, configuration. All right, so these are general tools used to reveal steps in a signal transduction cascade. And if, if you understand the, the cascade, the steps, then you would know where cholera toxin would fit in, pertussis toxin would fit in, lithium would fit in, and GTP gamma S would fit in. Okay, so um, 
Now what I want to finish up with is just talking a little bit about the role of enzymes in amplifying signals. And I think I've actually covered that to some extent because I've told you that these enzymes have these turnover rates that range from 5 or 10 per second to 400,000 per second. And depending upon which enzyme you have in your signal transduction pathway, you can create <laughs> a lot of amplifiers very quickly or you can create mm, still a lot but maybe not a gross amount. So uh, in every signal transduction pathway there are enzymes that play a role uh, because these enzymes create more amplifiers and the rate at which they create more amplifiers will tell you how much amplification you're going to get. Um, so as I say some enzymes are relatively slow like in the G protein pathway they go you know kind of five or ten per second which you know from our point of view is pretty damn fast but from the point of view of enzymology you know there are enzymes that go 400,000 per second. I even heard there was one that does a million per second. I don't know if I believe that um, but anyway so but every signal transduction pathway has different enzymes stuck in the pathway and their role is basically to create more amplifiers and they can create it faster or slower depending upon how fast you want the pathway to go. And you know, different pathways go faster and some of them go slower. All right, so basically then today uh, to review, um, what we have done is given a kind of a general introduction to signal amplification. And the basic theme there is to, to get a signal amplified, and like a hormone binding to a receptor, that's the signal. To get it amplified, you have to link the activation of the receptor to downstream steps, every step of which creates more amplifiers. And they do it at different rates. But even the slowest signal transduction chain from one hormone would create at least 50 amplifiers in a second. And <laughs> given that you typically have a million hormones binding to receptors at the same time, you know, you're looking at uh, 50 million amplifiers created in a period of a second. And that can do, make the cell really get up and moving, I mean really moving uh, pretty quick. Uh, and, and that's the whole point of signal transduction is to get very rapid changes in what the cell is doing in response to a stimulus. And sometimes the response has to be very fast. So we talked as an example of signal transduction, we talked about G-protein linked signal transduction. We talked about heterotrimeric G-proteins. What activates G-alpha? What does it do? What turns it off? We talked about the tools for studying G-protein signaling. Cholera toxin, pertussis toxin, uh, lithium, and the uh, GTP gamma S. And then we, we talked generally about the role of enzymes in amplifying signals. Okay, guys. I hope you learn all this stuff before we get together on Monday, but um, if not, we can talk about it a little bit more then. Enjoy your weekend. Take care.